League of Legends kind of sucks playing sometimes, but the lore in it is actually pretty good. And luckily today we're going over which champion has the best lore in League of Legends. To figure that out, I asked all of you this exact question. And here are the results from the thousands of votes I received. Welcome to another episode of Chosen by You. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy and let's get into things. All right, starting things off with the number 10 spot, we have the Shreeman Emperor Azir. Okay, so I actually really like Azir as a character and I think his story is actually pretty good too. So I'm really glad to see him in the top 10. A long story short, thousands of years ago, Azir was the youngest son of a Shreeman Emperor. And during that time, he made friends with a boy that he met in a library. However, that boy was a slave. And during that time, they weren't supposed to make friends with slaves. But Azir basically said, screw it, I'm naming you Zareth and we're gonna be friends. Azir also hated the idea of slavery, so he also vowed to cancel slavery one day too. Anyways, while everyone was traveling one time, Azir and his dad, along with his brothers, were all jumped by assassins. Renekton luckily managed to go legendary and protect the Emperor, but not before the assassins got a triple kill. Or quadra kill? Maybe it was a pentakill. I actually don't know how many older brothers Azir had. But either way, all of his brothers died. Oh yeah, and Zareth also protected Azir from one of the assassins too. That's how Azir survived. So yeah, good job Zareth. Anyways, later the Emperor was rightfully pissed at people killing all of his heirs. Well, almost all of them, but the Emperor didn't really like Azir, so it might as well have been in his eyes. In fact, he didn't like Azir so much that he actually tried to have more kids just so he could get a better heir. Crazy enough though, he was even successful on one of his attempts. That is until a bolt of lightning literally came down and smited his baby and wife multiple times. Double kill. Anyways, after that, the emperor unalived himself and then Azir became the new emperor. Woo. After that, for the next few years, things were actually pretty chill in Chirima until Azir wanted to ascend through a ritual, aka just become OP like Renekton. But little did he know his so-called best friend was pissed at him for not freeing the slaves. So during the ritual, he yeeted him out of the safe zone into the beam of light, took his spot instead, and then Zareth was the one who ascended. Trima then fell apart after Azir was offed. Thousands of years passed, and then the blood of Azir's descendants actually resurrected Azir. So now that he's back, the dude's basically trying to rebuild Trima. Shirima will once again stretch to the horizon. But yeah, that's pretty much the basics. Overall, he really does have a pretty interesting and solid story, and like I said, he's just a really cool character too. There's a lot of champions in this game, and even on this list that I feel like play a specific role that every game has, but I feel like Azir is actually pretty original. Anyways, lore-wise, I'm pretty satisfied with him being in the top 10. Hey, really quick, did you know there's an app out there that gives you an entire page of stats specific to you? This free app is called Mobilytics, and they're also the sponsor of today's video. It's on top of the stats page, Mobilytics also has a feature that shows your entire champion pool and the champions that you have the worst matchups in for each champion you play. In other words, it's really easy to see who you should probably ban depending on who you're playing. It also shows the best and most popular matchups too. On top of that, it even has a graph to show you when you're winning and losing depending on the day you play. Additionally, it of course has a ton of useful in-game features too, like CS trackers, summoner spell timers, a HUD to show you how much gold you need until an item, and you can even set up notifications to tell you when the other team buys something too. It's honestly kind of a game changer, so make sure to check it out using my link in the description. All right, moving on, at the number nine spot, we have Aurelian Soul. First off, this dude already deserves to be on this list just for his voice lines and voice. I don't think you'll ever be able to hear Neil Kaplan voice something and not get chills. Darkness is my only true enemy. Next, I'm not gonna lie, I actually didn't really know too much about Aurelian's whole story until I was making this video. But I have to admit, after looking more into it, it's pretty good. Aurelian's whole story is specifically unique because he's literally at the beginning of pretty much every story. This dude literally created the light, the stars, and he was, I quote, born in the first breath of creation. So yeah. Anyways, here's his lore. One day in his adventures of roaming the universe, he came across a new world, aka Runeterra, that he realized he didn't create. So he was, of course, pretty curious about it. The aspect seeing this, then baited him to come closer with some offerings, which somehow worked and ended up giving Asol a crown as a gift. But instead of a gift, it was more like an F you because this crown not only sucked his knowledge from him, but also yeeted him back into the heavens, preventing him from getting near Runeterra again. Apparently, this crown was so OP too that he couldn't even break it, which is actually kind of crazy when you think about it. Anyways, with the Aspect's new knowledge from Aurelian Soul, they then created the Sun Discs, which then they used those discs to, of course, create Ascended God Warriors, which you already know from Azir's story. Now, Aurelian Soul was rightfully pissed off about the whole thing, which really makes this last part of the lore that much more intriguing, where they mention him finally being able to feel the magic holding him start to weaken. What's the matter, Targon? Losing your grip? This might be a hot take, but I think the reason Aurelian Soul is actually ranked so high right now is not because of the written lore currently, but more for what could be to come with just that last bit of information. I mean, this dude could easily just end everything, making every single event on Runeterra feel like child's play. Diego, Aatrox, all of their stories wouldn't even compare because if this dude gets free, it's literally GG. I mean, who's gonna realistically stop him? Sure, the Aspects did once, but that's just because he willingly came down to get the gift, and I don't think he's falling for that again. Also, this dude is freaking huge. Not that. 
that size matters or anything. <clears throat> Either way, we probably have nothing to worry about for the sole reason that Riot would probably never do it because they'd literally have no lore left if he escaped. We'll see though. Also, fun fact, these celestial beings that Aurelian Soul talked about were almost going to be his sisters who controlled other aspects of space, such as gravity or dark matter. Could still be possible though. All right, at number eight, we have Silas. Silas's story is unique because it's essentially a fictional story of racism in Runeterra. It's also one of those stories that's kind of eye-opening for people when they first start getting into the lore because they quickly realize that Demacians aren't your typical good guys that they appear to be and that things are a lot more complicated. I can't be the only one who thought that originally, right? Like Demacia clearly looks like the good guys and Noxus clearly look like the stereotypical bad guys. At least that's what I thought when starting. But learning that's far from the truth is actually what makes things a lot more interesting. Anyways, here's kind of the rundown of Silas's lore. Silas was born as a mage in a poor Demacian family, which is probably the worst spawn you could possibly get in Demacia. Because if you don't know, Demacians hate magic. Like not just hate it too, but they hate it. Like they, they execute people for just having it. So yeah, not a great start for Silas. And his parents weren't too thrilled about it either because they're the ones who actually convinced him to turn himself into the Mage Seekers. I would explain who those guys are, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Luckily for him, the Mage Seekers actually found his magic useful because he could actually see who had magic and help them basically snitch people out. Silas did this for a while too and also eventually found out a lot of wealthy people actually had magic, but the Mage Seekers only cared about the poor people who had magic, which was his first red flag that things were kind of fucked up. Anyways, one day they went out in the countryside and found a girl mage, but Silas took pity on her and tried actually shielding her from the mage seekers. Unfortunately for him, that was also when he accidentally found out when his alt worked and accidentally brushed up against the girl, which ultimately caused magic to surge through him, killing the mage seekers. Silas ran after this happened, but was eventually found and sentenced to life in prison. He was then held there with his patented chains and Runeterra's version of kryptonite, aka petrocyte. Fun fact, it's also the same stuff Galio's made of. Also, they basically thought that the petrocyte suppressed his magic. Anyways, during his time in prison, Lux started talking to him, and in exchange for knowledge on magic, Lux gave him information on what was happening outside of his cell. Oh, and she also gave him a book that told him the kryptonite rock thing wasn't actually suppressing his magic, but just sucking the magic out of him and storing it. Anyways, they eventually found out the two were chatting, which Lux's family wasn't too happy about, so they decided to have Silas executed. But it wasn't before Silas was able to touch Lux, get that surge of magic again, and bust his way out with his ult. And now that he's escaped, he's on a mission to essentially take down Demacia, or at least their racist anti-mage society. The Great Mage Rebellion starts now! There's of course a lot more smaller things that go into his story, which just adds to his lore even further, but overall that's pretty much the gist of things. Speaking of other small things about his lore too, Silas actually has no last name because his family was so low on the social spectrum. Additionally, the scar on his abdomen is actually the result of an operation when he tried to remove his quote-unquote magic organ because there was a theory that mages had a magic organ somewhere below the liver. But yeah, he's a pretty solid number eight choice. All right, moving on to number seven, we have Fiddlesticks. Fiddlesticks' lore is oddly a bit confusing since it's pretty split up, so I'll try my best to summarize it. To start, Fiddlesticks is actually one of 10 different ancient demons that have been around way before humans ever existed. And out of them, Fiddlesticks is the most powerful. These 10 demon kings, including Fiddlesticks, were locked away a long time ago by the gods. And in the process, the gods also made 10 keys to help keep them locked up, as well as drain Fiddlesticks from his power. These keys were then hidden all throughout Runeterra. One day, though, at the stupidity of a mage, Fiddlesticks was released slash summoned, and now Fiddlesticks runs free in Runeterra. Nice. Now besides just being a killing demon, Fiddlesticks is also on a mission to free the other demon kings and also gain his full power back, and to do this, he needs to find all 10 keys. Now it's not 100% confirmed on how many keys he already has, but in the old splash art, he actually had one around his neck, but in the new one, we can actually see three around Fiddlesticks, which means he's getting closer and closer to his goal. The Celestials saw this as kind of a big problem, so Zoe was sent to delay his progress and she actually managed to even steal a key, which you can even see in her splash art. This was even confirmed in Fiddlesticks' bio too, where he says a child of twilight stealing the joy from a ragged whispering horror. In that comment on joy was actually the key holding the demon of joy Ashlash in. Anyways, that's the basic idea of Fiddlesticks, but honestly, his story reaches so much further out. Like into Neela, for example. Neela got her powers from Ashlash, and in exchange for powers, she can only feel intense joy. But now one of her missions is to stop Fiddlesticks. But anyways, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at now. This still just scratches the surface with Fiddlesticks, and there's really so much more too that makes his lore stick out above the others. For one, the voice and voice lines. Fear. Besides actually sounding really creepy, Fiddlesticks likes to remind champions of their greatest fear, so he has specific interactions with certain champions to help trigger that. For example, here's what he says when he runs into Misfortune, reminding her of her past when her parents were being murdered in front of her by Gangplank. Hide Sarah. 
Anyways, he really is a pretty interesting character and definitely fills that role of the creepy type of character I feel like every video game has. All right, next, moving on to number six, we have Kindred. Kindred's lore is very different from the others. Kindred is essentially the Grim Reaper of Runeterra, and by that, I mean whenever someone is on the verge of death, they see Kindred and Kindred kills them. Every life ends with us. However, how they die, though, is determined by their choice on if they accept death or they fight against it. If they accept it, Lamb shoots an arrow into them, giving them a swift death. But if they try and run from it, Wolf gets to chase them down and chew them up, which I've heard is more painful. Also, apparently, different parts of Runeterra find it more honorable to choose one over the other as well. For example, Demacians think it's better to accept death from Lamb, and Noxians try everything they can to live. Some places like Frail Yord even embrace the idea of Wolf, vowing to honor his chase with the blood of their enemies. Also, Kindred was actually originally a single being, but due to him being isolated from everyone, being the Grim Reaper and all, he decided to cut himself in half so he wouldn't be as lonely. Can't even blame the guy. But thus, after Kindred became two beings, both Lamb and Wolf, which also gave kind of a yin and yang feel to them. Their split is also why Riot named Kindred Kindred, because the word itself means being related or similar in nature. Also, fun fact, Kindred is also one of the only champions, I believe, to have a champion's icon that is different from the splash art, because, well, Kindred is two different beings. Also, another fun fact, I'm not gonna lie, I actually knew nothing about Kindred's lore before reading into this. But now that I do, the cinematic from this year makes so much more sense. Like, I just thought it was a sick visual before, but now that I have some context, it makes it 10 times better. Trinimir is essentially fighting off his moment of death where Kindred appears, but because of his undying rage, he can't be killed. So eventually, Kindred disappears. It's also probably why you see that head tilt too from Lamb, because Lamb's also probably confused. But yeah, it's pretty cool they actually put that much detail into it. Now moving on to the top five, and coming in at number five with 280 votes, we have Mordekaiser. This guy's story is actually ridiculous. Tamord was originally a not-so-nice conquering warlord named San Uzal, who basically just tried to crush everyone in his path with the wholesome goal of earning an eternal seat at the God's Table in the Hall of Bones after he dies. Hashtag goals. And during his time alive, he thought he actually did enough to do so, but when he actually died, he quickly found out that none of that actually existed, and instead it was just a gray wasteland of eternal fog. While he was in the fog, he also realized that he wasn't exactly alone. He could hear whispers and see spirits fade away. But this dude was so stubborn that he refused to fade away and as time went on he actually started learning the language of the whispers he was hearing to the point he was able to understand it and actually tempt sorcerers to resurrect him. This dude literally learned an entire new language from scratch just because he was tilted there was no bones table. Anyways once Mord was back thanks to the help of the sorcerers he didn't really have a body anymore so they used his old armor to encase his spirit and even though the sorcerers were planning on using him for wars and whatnot Thon just decided to kill them so that didn't really work out for them too well. Additionally this was also about the time when Sanuzal turned into Mordekaiser, and also when he started round two of conquering the realm. However, he didn't have a weapon, so he forged a mace out of the sorcerers he unalived. At least he gave it a fun name called Nightfall. Eventually, Mord set up home base, which was called the Immortal Bastion. And also eventually, people weren't too happy about having a tyrant around, so between a Noxy tribe alliance and getting betrayed by his own squad, aka LeBlanc, Mord was taken down. Specifically, his spirit was separated from his armor and was once again chucked into the gray fog place. But this time, he was actually actually banking on it because he realized that there were a ton of dark souls and spirits down there that could be used as an army. So he's been basically building up an empire and army in the foggy death realm. In other words, one day Mord is definitely going to come back and when he does, he is going to clap some cheeks. I carve my kingdom beyond from the ashes of nothing. With all that said, a lot of people still think his old lore is better, but I have to say, his new lore is still pretty good too. Overall though, Mord is just a cool character with a solid story. Alright, coming up on the number 4 spot, with 291 votes, we have Pantheon. First off, Pantheon's lore is kind of special because it's one of the few champions who actually kept a lot of their old lore. Not 100% of everything, but they mostly just changed around the timeline a bit to make it work with the other champions' updated lores. Nevertheless, Pantheon's lore is definitely unique and a pretty good story. To start, Pantheon was originally some one named Atreus before, and Atreus was from Targon. Atreus was never the best or most skilled at anything, but he was really determined. That was kind of his thing. One day he met someone named Pylos, and they basically became homies through all the training they did. Eventually, their squad were attacked by barbarians, and him and Pylos were the only two survivors. So to get revenge, they climbed to Mount Targon to get the powers of the Aspects. Unfortunately, Pylos didn't make it, and once Atreus did, the Aspect of War, aka Pantheon, didn't think Atreus was worthy enough to lend his powers. So instead, he just straight up took over 
over his body. Kind of a dick move. Atreus still wasn't technically dead though, he was more just mentally yeeted aside. Anyways, fast forward a lot, Pantheon eventually fought Aatrox, but it didn't go so hot because Aatrox poked his sword through Pantheon, which I've heard is not too good for you. And I turned out to be right because it ultimately ended up killing Pantheon the aspect. This is also why Pantheon actually has a huge scar on his chest in the slash art. Anyways, this incident actually brought Atreus back mentally into his body since Pantheon was no longer there. And once he was back, Atreus kind of did his signature move and got back up. I fight until the blood takes the spear from my grasp, until I can only crawl. And even then, you will not defeat me. Later, after he recovered, he found Aatrox again and fought him again, even though he didn't have Pantheon's power anymore. But even after being slapped around a bit, this dude still jumped up and managed to cut off Aatrox's arm. Holy frick. But yeah, that was pretty much his main story. On top of his main backstory, Pantheon also has a few other short stories, but honestly, I think the reason people really like him is just because he's not only cool, but also relatable since everyone already knows about Spartans and how badass Spartans were. Plus, according to Riot, he's not even six feet tall. He's 5'9 or 176.25 centimeters. Very specific. Anyways, it's either that or people just love him because he wants to be a baker. All right, now into the bronze spot with 344 votes, we of course have Aatrox. It's actually fairly appropriate. Aatrox comes right after Pantheon considering how much of a role he played in Pantheon's story. Anyway, surprisingly, I feel like Aatrox is one of those champions whose lore isn't well known by many people, despite how complex and good it is. Either way, here's his lore. Aatrox was actually Shuriman originally, and an ascended Shuriman warrior at that. One day, though, the queen asked Aatrox to go fight the Void, and even though Aatrox and the homies won, they all kind of got messed up from their experiences fighting them. In a sense, they developed a ridiculous form of PTSD. Anyway, Shurima eventually fell, Aatrox and the Sunborn began to fight against each other, and eventually a new war broke out. This was also when Aatrox, along with the other fallen ascended, started being referred to as the Darken. This was also when the Targonians and the aspects of Twilight started getting involved because they saw the Darkens as a real threat. So the Targonians, aka Pantheon and friends, got some knowledge from the aspects of Twilight, aka Zoe, on how to defeat them, and then proceeded to defeat them specifically by shoving Aatrox in his own sword. Luckily for him, some rando came along, tried to pick up the sword, and he ended up being able to take over his body, thus returning to life-ish. I say ish because, well, look at him. His new purpose is even to try and reach his previous ascended form, but realize that probably isn't happening. So now he's on a mission to destroy everything and cause as much chaos as possible because he thinks that's the only way to destroy his blade to free himself. I am in a cage within a prison, but this foul shape reminds me of my purpose. Now, besides the story just being really well written and just being interesting overall, I think what really separates Aatrox's lore from the others is his story kind of becomes the catalyst for so many other events and characters. I mean, we can see him literally all over Runeterra, from Shurima to the Freljord, to even his attack on Demacia, which we even get to see in the cinematic. This dude quite literally just creates chaos wherever he possibly can, which also just makes for an interesting background and connection with other champions. He is essentially a gateway into so many other stories for Runeterra and the lore. Anyways, I think it's safe to say that this dude is definitely deserving of the number three spot. In the runner-up spot, the champion with the second best lore with 365 votes is Viego. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not really too surprised here, especially because one, the lore is actually good, and two, the Ruination event also helped a lot with getting the word out on his story. Even people that don't know or keep track of lore super well, aka me, know at least a bit of Viego's story because of the marketing done with the Ruination event. I'm not gonna go too deep into his entire background because of the fact that I think most people already know, but Nevertheless, here we go. Long story short, Viego unexpectedly became a king at a young age because his brother died, but really didn't know how to rule. And what made things worse is when a seamstress named Solde came along, because Viego immediately started simping for her and then pretty much chucked all his kingly duties that he was actually doing aside to hang out with her. As a result, his entire nation started falling apart, pissing off allies, his people, his nation, and pretty much everyone. And this guy was simping so hard that his enemies even realized it and used it as the perfect time to attack. An assassin even even tried to unalive Viego with a poison dagger, but somehow completely missed Viego and ended up grazing Isolde instead. Isolde ended up dying. Viego got pissed, like really pissed, and then spent literally all of the nation's money trying to bring her back. Nothing worked, of course, until one day he heard about magic water in the Blessed Isles, where he then used his army to steamroll everyone to get there. He then dunked Isolde into the water, and it worked. She actually came back. 
Except she came back more like the mom from Full Metal Alchemist. She didn't really last long. And it was kind of gross. It was also just long enough though for her to be able to poke Viego with a sword and unalive him. Then between magic swords and magic water, there was a big boom and thus everything turned green and deathly. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into a story, but that kind of sums things up. With that said, part of the reason I think his lore is so good is because similar to Aatrox, he is the centerpiece for so many champions lore. Like Thresh, Callista, Hecarim, Gwen, Senna, Lucian, Maokai, Yorick. I mean, the list literally goes on. Not only that, but his story is just so complex and detailed, but in a good and interesting way. Needless to say, though, it does make sense that he is sitting in the number two spot. All right, and finally, the title for the champion with the best lore, according to all of you with 415 votes, goes to none other than Kata Jin. This dude is definitely a one of a kind character. I cannot be good. I must be perfection. Here's the basic rundown of his lore. Jin's story revolves around him essentially being a murderous sociopath from Ionia who believes death is a form of art. Over his early years, his work in killing gained such an intense reputation that nearly everyone in Ionia thought the horrific events that he did were caused by a golden demon. Little did they know it was actually the work of Jin. Because of the horrific actions the so-called golden demon had been doing, the Council of Zun pinged Great Master Kushu for help. And so Master Kushu, along with Shen, his son, who was actually a teenager at the time, and Zed went out on the hunt. For the next four years, coincidence, definitely not, the Golden Demon managed to stay out of their reach. However, during that time, all three of them witnessed some pretty f***ed up sh that Jin did, which mentally made them literally depressed and physically even turned Kushu's red beard white. Jesus. Eventually though, Kushu had a great idea to cosplay as a calligrapher during a Spirit Blossom Festival, hoping that the Golden Demon, aka Jin, would want to come try and f*** it up. And he did. That then actually led them to catching Jin and finding out that it's Jin and not in fact a demon. Zed and Shen wanted to kill him right then and there, which makes sense because of all the f***ed up stuff they saw over the years, but Kushu said no. And so instead, they locked him in prison where Jin got to show off his smithing skills, poetry skills, and his dance skills. And the monks there were very happy about that part. Finally, he was later freed by Kushu, and now he spends his day supposedly being used by the Ionian elders. This then led to Zed finding out Kushu released him, which of course is a big part of Zed's lore. Anyways, overall, I think the reason that Jin was voted the best is just because the story is so well written, and not just because of the general lore, which is good, but also just a lot of the smaller stuff and details too. His entire theme, his terrifying elegance, his unsettling calmness, all makes for a really interesting character. Not to mention his relationship and obsession with the number four. It's also this obsession that even made Riot obsessed with it, which meant we loved the champion even more. Like making it so Jin is spelt with four letters, Jin making a four on a keyboard, the collector displaying four, 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 four when he kills someone with it, Jin costing 4,444 blue essence, to even Jin's fourth shot critting turrets at a 44% reduced damage. Everyone is now just obsessed with four when you play him, which is also why the only reason it sucks he earned the top spot is because he didn't end up at number four. Anyways, while everyone may not agree Jin has the best lore, he's definitely at least top tier. Really quick, if you'd like to help vote for the next Chosen by You episode, I need your help in finding out who the funnest champion to play in the game is. I'll leave a link to the forum in the description where you can vote, and seriously, thank you guys to everyone who voted for this last one as well. Overall, I have to say, I really do appreciate how much effort Riot puts into the lore of their characters. The game itself may not always be great, but the lore is pretty top tier. Also, before I end this video, I have a small disclaimer. I admittedly am not the most knowledgeable when it comes to lore, which is also why if I made a mistake in this, which I probably did, I apologize. Please don't smite me. But anyways, I actually knew so little that I had to read into almost all of these champions stories to get more detail. It's also why these specific types of videos are really hard for me to give some personal perspective on the results. But that said, even with my limited knowledge, I saw some questionable results on the list. Not really for the top 10, thank god, but more for just some of the other results in general. But to conclude these theories, I had someone with a bit more knowledge on more help give their input on the matter. Nah, what, what, what the hell is this? Some kind of sick outside joke? I can understand the top 10. That's reasonable. A lot of those champions, despite not being very popular play rate wise, do have some fantastic fantastic stories. But um, what's Camille doing at spot number 40? What's Cho'Gath, a champion mind you, who does not even canonically exist in Runeterra, doing it only eight spots below, a champion with one of the most heart-wrenching narratives in the entirety of League? Did you guys even read the lore? What is this? Oh, Shackles ranked at 25. Okay, yeah, that explains everything. All right, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to sub if you enjoy, and I will see you next time. A massive shout out to my incredible patrons and supporters. We had Gooseman and Hagel, and a ginormous shout out to, of course, Wolf for being a freaking tier three patron. Seriously, thank you all so much, and I will see you next time. Bye.